this meeting of the Committee on Health and Human Service Policy to order. Um, since we don't have a quorum yet, um, what I'd like to do will, is begin with um, House File 267 by Representative Schultz. Representative Schultz, can you, would you like to move your bill? Sure, I'll move the bill, House File 267. And is it being moved to the General Register? Thank you so much, Representative Schultz. Can you speak to your bill? Sure, House File 267 is simply a technical bill, and it recodifies the Elderly Waiver Program statutes and makes conforming changes. So this is exactly the same bill that we, was introduced last session that sat in the General Register and did not get passed. So the language in the bill, it's not intended to change any existing policy or to have a, a policy or a fiscal impact. So no policy changes or fiscal impact. It's the agency's technical changes to um, elderly waiver program. All right, thank you, Representative Schultz. Do you have a testifier? I think we're gonna have the research staff, Danielle, walk us through the, the technical bill. Thank you so much. Finale. Madam Chair and members, uh, House File 262, as Representative Schultz mentioned, is the Elderly Waiver Recodification Bill. This is a, a bill that um, resulted from a law that was passed in 2017 that instructed the reviser of statutes in consultation with the House Research Department, the Senate Council Department, and then the Department of Human Services to recodify laws governing the elderly waiver program. So Article 1 of this bill is the actual recodification, and then Article 2 is technical and conforming cross-reference changes. Um, and what was done in Article 1 is that the staff have reorganized the elderly waiver program language for clarity and ease of use, removed obsolete language, used consistent terminology, defined previously undefined terms, and redrafted the language for clarity and consistency. Um, and this language has been seen by um, stakeholder groups. We worked with the Department of Human Services on it. As far as I know, um, it's not controversial at all, and there isn't any opposition to it. Thank you, Ms. Pinelli. Um, is there anyone in the audience who would like to testify on House File 267? Great. Is there any discussion from the committee members? Okay. Okay, so what we're going to do is lay the bill over until we have a quorum, then we'll come back to the bill, Representative Schultz. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so next we have um, House File 258, Representative Lean. Welcome to the committee, Representative Lee. Uh, the chair moves that House File 258 be recommended for re-referral to the committee on, we, on ways and means. Uh, we have the bill before the committee. Welcome, Representative Lean, again um, to Health and Human Service Policy. And I understand you have an author's amendment. Madam Chair, that, that is correct. I right do. Because <laughs> we don't have a quorum. Um, so why don't we just... Um, Okay. Why don't you go ahead and discuss the amendment and present the bill? All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, committee members, for hearing House File 258. Uh, we are offering this bill as it would provide a rate, uh, a rate setting mechanism for nonprofit nursing homes located in Moorhead, uh, equal to the median rate for nursing homes located in North Dakota cities contiguous to Moorhead. 
This bill will finish work that was started in 2015 with Representative Backer uh, when a similar provision for a nursing home in Breckenridge was enacted, Breckenridge, Minnesota. Although we are seeing a more realistic state budget picture right now in North Dakota, um, in recent years the state had increased its Medicaid rates paid to nursing homes, and this what led to a wide disparity in rates in border communities that resulted in severe staffing issues and nursing homes, uh, staffing issues for nursing homes located in Minnesota communities adjacent to North Dakota cities. The 2015 uh, nursing home reform bill did help address this disparity, uh, as did the downturn in oil production in North Dakota. However, this bill is still important to ensure that the crisis situation does not happen again. Uh, this bill is important to maintaining the needed services uh, and, and access to medical assistance beds for the elderly in the Moorhead area now and going into the future. Uh, members, I urge your support for House File 258. And with me today, I have Nathan Johnson, who uh, is from Eventide Lutheran Nursing Home in Moorhead to testify on the bill. Thank you. Um, Mr. Uh, Johnson, could you, um, just for the committee, uh, introduce yourself and who, you, who you're with and to your bill? Sure. Thank to, you, Madam Chair. testimony, I'm sorry. Madam Chair, members of the committee, I'm Nathan Johnson. I'm the administrator of Eventide Senior Living Homes in Moorhead, Minnesota. I'm here to talk about our nonprofit nursing home. I want to thank Representative Lean for bringing this legislation forward. Then the, during the recent economic boom in North Dakota, North Dakota nursing facility rates have increased substantially during that time. The average rates paid to those North Dakota facilities was over 20% higher than our rate. The difference caused a severe staff shortage for even, Eventide and jeopardized our ability to maintain our medical assistant beds in Minnesota in Moorhead. This crisis was resolved for the time being due, the, due to the slowdown of the North Dakota economy. HF 258 would help us avoid another potential crisis in the future in a community that encompasses two state reimbursement models. The 2015 nursing home reform legislation has without question helped us with this issue and for that we are grateful. However, the rate system includes a lag period. That with another North Dakota economic boom will create a substantial challenge until the rate system leg catches up. I encourage you to support HF 258 as a solution to the North Dakota border bill city problem and make providing medical assistant beds in Minnesota viable in the future. We have the need, but currently much of our Minnesota need is being met by the North Dakota facilities. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Um, is there anyone else in the audience who would like to testify to this bill? Members, do we have any questions? Okay, we do not have a quorum, so we're gonna lay this bill over until we get a full quorum of the committee. Thank you so much for calling you back. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. All right. Um, I think we would like to maybe move, before we bring another bill forward, uh, move to the presentation by the Department of Human Services, the Disability Waivers Rate System. All right. Please introduce yourself for the record. Hello, Madam Chair, members. My name is Alex Bartolik. I'm with the Department of Human Services. I'm also here with my colleague, Colin Stemper, and we're going to give you a review of the disability waiver rate system. Uh, we will go through it, and then there'll be time for questions if people are interested uh, in getting more information on any of the points. Just as an overview, we have four disability waiver programs in Minnesota. They started at different times to serve different populations. One serves people with developmental disabilities. One serves people uh, under a program we call the Community Access for Disability Inclusion, which serves people at risk of nursing home level of care. We have a program uh, for community alternative care for people who are at risk of hospital level of care, uh, as well as a brain injury waiver for people who are both at risk of either a nursing home or a more specialized hospital care. 
Um, collectively, we, these are called the disability waivers. Uh, they're called waiver because we're actually waiving some of the federal requirements for the use of Medicaid that typically govern how Medicaid would be used in institutional settings. Uh, when we talk about the waiver services, we are not talking about personal care assistance services. That's a separate program through the state plan uh, that's unique compared to the waivers. And these waivers were established starting uh, in the early 1980s as a cost-effective alternative to institutional care. Prior to 2013, waiver services, uh, the rates were determined through negotiations with counties. Counties actually administer these programs. They were the ones who held contracts with providers, developed services, authorized services, and they held contracts with all of the providers. And as part of the, that contracting, they both assured that providers met certain standards, but they also negotiated the rates for services. Uh, and as a result, there are varying rates, not only between counties, but often for providers, depending on when they started services within a county. In 2007, the federal government informed Minnesota that this method of rate setting did not comply with federal regulations for a uniform rate methodology. Basically, they were concerned that people with disabilities did not have equal access to services and that the state needed to have more oversight and structure a rate setting methodology that could be used across the state. Uh, they did put us on a corrective action plan during this time period, we could not amend our waivers to increase the number of people that we were allowed to serve, and it was ultimately jeopardizing the funding that was used to support over 37,000 people. Uh, in response, in 2009, the legislature did authorize the development of a new rate setting methodology. The department worked with contractors who were able to look across the country, gather quite a bit of information about the costs of services, uh, and working with a lot of stakeholders to develop what is now the disability waiver rate system. And the 2013 legislature approved the rate system with a number of caveats, including research that needed to be done on an ongoing basis to truly evaluate what it takes to deliver services. Under DWRS, or the Disability Waiver Rate System, each service has a formula. We call it a framework because it's a way of laying out what are the components that should be taken into account of what providers pay for, what their costs are to actually deliver services. And these components are outlined in state statute. Uh, the statute does include an inflationary increase once every five years. In this framework with the different formulas, um, they start on the basis of direct support professional wages. And the direct support wages in the disability waiver rate formulas are based on information primarily through the Bureau of Labor Statistics saying what people have been paying for those services. And it varies from 1227 um, an hour to 22.38. These are median wages, it's giving an idea of the average wages, and they do vary depending upon the type of service, whether you're working in a group home, or whether, for example, the $22.38 an hour uh, base wage is for people who have specialized experience in providing employment supports uh, and with additional training and support through that. For day services, the median wage is $15.30 an hour. For residential, it's $13.53, but then there's a number of different services which vary over time. And these are wages that we monitor over time. It's what people are paying. There's additional parts to the, to the formulas that include the benefits, the supervision, what it takes to provide training. Some of them include the time it takes a provider to document or travel that aren't otherwise reimbursed as a direct one-to-one, -one, as well as administrative costs. Following the five years of development and planning with stakeholders, DWRS began implementation in 2014. Uh, when the legislature authorized the disability waiver rate system, it allowed for a period of rate stabilization, a transition period, which would allow providers to be paid at historic rates with only minor changes up or down, depending on what their future rate were going to be, using services in 2013 as the base. And this was done because, one, we were doing more research 
it was all very conceptual. We wanted to actually see the data as people started moving into this. Uh, we also had additional research that we needed to do. This phase in period is also called banding. Um, and the, the term banding means that then rates can't vary more than a certain percentage over this time of transition. We originally were authorized for a five year period of banding. And then the legislature did authorize a sixth year of banding. And then there was a request to authorize a seventh year of banding that the legislature approved. CMS did not approve the seventh year of banding. Um, they didn't feel that there was sufficient reason why we were continuing to use more time. And uh, so the banding will end December 31st, 2019. And at this time going forward, all the disability waiver services will be paid for through the frameworks that are in the different formulas. It will take a year. It doesn't happen at one point in time. Just as people's authorizations come up over the course of a year, then the services will be adjusted to reflect the framework uh, period of time. I'm going to turn this over to Colin Stemper, who is the supervisor for our fiscal policy area, to give you a little bit more detail about how this works. For the, uh, Mr. Stemmer. Thank you. And like Alex said, my name is Colin Stemper. I'm the supervisor of the fiscal policy team at the Disability Services Division at DHS. So a bit of an example of what we would be looking at if we were calculating a rate for a service. And the service we chose was day training and habilitation. So in statute, there are those different cost components that ultimately lead to a rate, but there are certain inputs uh, that are required of counties or tribal nations when they're actually calculating a rate uh, that would inform what the rate is. And that's what's uh, displayed on this slide. So th those could be the staffing ratio that uh, is uh, provided with the service, uh, whether the person is deaf or hard of hearing and a customization that goes along with that, uh, licensed practical nurse hours per day, registered nurse hours per day, and the person's county of residence. And all of those can go into changing what the rate uh, will actually be. This slide shows an example of what that actually looks like uh, as in, in terms of an Excel uh, document. So these are all available on the Dis uh, Department of Human Services website. Anyone can go check them out, play around with them, uh, calculate your own rates. And the yellow, uh, the yellow cells are the areas that the lead agency, the county or tribe would input to calculate a rate. For transparency's sake, all the components are there so you can see how how each rate is being put together and calculated. But when it comes to actually calculating the rate, only those yellow cells are ultimately being entered. So throughout the uh, banding period, uh, DHS has been doing research to determine uh, how are uh, the framework components set, whether modifications need to be recommended, and really what the difference is between those pre-DWS 2013 rates and rates after banding. So this slide shows our latest research from a December, tw uh, December 1st, 2018 report on the difference between the uh, pre-DWS rates and the DWS rates after banding. So overall, statewide, we uh, expect to see an increase uh, in the rates by about 14.1%. And when we look at the different types of services out there, we see a difference in uh, how those rates will look after banding. So for day services, we project a 3.3% increase in rates. For residential services, we project an average of a 14.8% increase in rates. For unit-based services without program, we project a 38.4% increase in rates. And for unit-based services with programming, we project an 11.3% increase in rates. And so oftentimes, because counties uh, were setting their own rates before DWS, this is reflecting the difference between how the rates were set previously and moving to a uniform uh, statewide rate setting method. So, Overall, uh, at a provider level, we expect 66% uh, of providers that serve people with banded rates to have framework rates uh, that are higher than current banded rates. So this next slide shows a graph from our last legislative report in 2017, kind of laying out by provider what we expect the effect of DWS implementation to look like. So you can see that most providers are receiving increases um, and those that are receiving decreases the longer tail is on the increase side uh, and fewer are seeing severe decreases. 
So uh, with the expiration of banding in 2019, DHS continues to work with lead agencies and providers to facilitate the transition to uh, framework implementation. In law, we have a DWS advisory committee that we meet with six times a year, and that committee reviews evaluations that the department does, uh, provides feedback on needed changes to implementation of DWS. So we receive constant feedback, and we appreciate the participation of uh, our partners in that committee. Uh, we've also begun implementing a process in January 2019 with providers and lead agencies to identify people with extraordinary needs who may need rate exceptions at the end of banding to provide a little bit more stability as this uh, period uh, occurs. And then ongoing throughout DWS implementation, we've been providing one-on-one -on -one technical assistance with providers and lead agencies as situations arrive. So we expect to continue that for years to come as questions happen. So that's a quick overview, overview of the disability waiver rate system. We'd be happy to answer any questions. But thank you for your testimony, uh, for your presentation. I appreciate it much. Uh, members, do you have any questions? Chair Liebling. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and uh, Mr. Stemple, thank you very much for that. Um, Stemper, I'm sorry. Um, so a couple questions about that. One is that you had on the slide there one of the categories of service that was going to go up the most after banding is unit-based services without programming. Could you just give us a little quick definition of what's a unit-based service either with or without programming? Mr. Stemper. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, yeah, that's one of those terms of art that are, are in statute and don't really translate to the real world. So that's a, a service, uh, one that comes to mind as personal support uh, that may, it's often delivered in 15 minute units. Sometimes these other services have daily units or hourly units. So these are 15 minute units. And without programming is kind of without a training component. So it's, it's a service that supports people, but it doesn't necessarily train the person or uh, provide training to the person to do uh, an activity. Okay. Chair Liebling. Thank you, Madam Chair. And second question, thank you, that's very helpful. And uh, second question, is there anything under current law, what, you know, we have these framework rates that are built um, with consideration of, of what it costs to pay a person who's providing the service. And um, just to be clear, when we're talking about providers, we're talking about organizations. And then we, I think we usually call them direct service professionals, right, or DSPs. Is there anything in the law now that requires the money that's in the rate calculation to actually be paid to the person who's providing the service? Mr. Stimper, or Mrs. <laughs> uh, uh, Madam Chair, and Representative Liebling, no, there's nothing in the law that requires people to spend it according to those categories. This is a prospective model of basing rates on average cost to deliver services, and then providers uh, have the ability and the flexibility to use those dollars in a way that will most help them implement services. We know that with the workforce shortage, they are all pressed trying to assure that they are able to attract and retain staff, but the law does not require them to spend money in certain categories. Chair Liebling. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and Ms. Bartolik, one of the issues that has arisen in the past, and I'm thinking back to, there was a, a report from the OLA a couple of years ago, I think, about home and community-based services. And one of the big uh, takeaways from that is that we don't have very good data. We haven't collected very good data about the very thing that you just mentioned, about where the money's going, where are the vacancies, what are the wages that the people are actually making. So um, is that in the law now, or is that something that we still have to uh, make sure that we get into the law? Ms. Bortolik. Madam Chair and Representative Liebling, in the law there is a requirement for cost reporting. This will have every provider once every five years, so it's on a rolling basis, so a certain percentage of providers are submitting information every year uh, that will say what the cost of delivering service are, what their costs have been. We will be getting this information. We do not have information about the workforce, about wages, vacancy, retention factors required on a more frequent basis. 
Uh, we have used, um, we have one survey out in the field right now to try to collect information on a voluntary basis. However, there is not a requirement for this information to be made available more routinely. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just one more kind of more of a comment. You know, Ms. Bartolik, I think the, the point you made about the workforce shortage and how wages, you know, employers need to raise wages and stuff, we're seeing this throughout the economy, that there is a workforce shortage, and we expect that wages would be really rising as employers compete for employees, and we're not always seeing that. So one of the concerns that I have about this, and if, if members want to go back and read that report from the Office of the Legislative Auditor, I should have brought my copy with me. It's, it's well marked up. Oh, good. Representative Schultz has it. And it's from 2017. I think it was February, if I'm not mistaken. But, but anyway, it's, it's really um, instructive because it talks about um, first of all, we spend a lot of money in this area, and that could be a good thing. I mean, we all, as Minnesotans, I think Minnesotans want people with disabilities to get good services and help them become independent and help them live their very best lives. I think we all have a joint shared goal around that. And yet, for these billions of dollars that get spent, we don't know that the people delivering the service are actually what kind of wages they're getting. And we haven't had very good reporting on exactly you know, where the money was going and, and how effectively we're, we're buying the services that we think we're buying. So I, um, I just wanted to kind of raise that point. As we go forward with changing this rate system, um, that I think some of the bills, I'm not sure if it's uh, Representative Halverson's bill, Representative Schultz's bill, or, you know, I know there's some effort to increase the reporting and make sure that we start to get some of this data so that, so that the legislature can um, more accurately manage the system. Because I think that we really want to make sure not only that people get these really vital services that they need, but also that the people who are providing the services are actually making a fair wage and a living wage. And even if we uh, just go ahead and raise all these rates, because as you said, there's no requirement that the provider agencies actually pay these, um, these rates that are built into the formula, um, we can't just assume that that will happen. We really, we, we want to make sure that that we're actually taking care of the, the people who need the help and making sure that the money goes to the people who are actually giving the care. So thank you for giving me that time, Madam Chair. Dear yes. uh, Members, any other questions? Well, thank you for your presentation. So we have a poem that is present. Um, may I have a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Okay, so we're going to need two motions. We have two sets of um, minutes to approve. Uh, can I get the first motion to uh, move minutes for February the 7th? 5th, I'm sorry, February the 5th, 2019. So moved. So moved. So Representative Freiburg moves um, approval of the minutes for February the 5th. Any discussion? Hearing none, those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? The motion prevails in the minutes for February the 5th, 2019 has been approved. Okay, so now we need to review the approvals of minutes for February the 6th. Um, any motion to approve the minutes? So moved. <laughs> so moved. Okay, Representative. Bonner, Representative Bonner, approves a moves approval for the minutes for February the 6th. Any discussion, members? Hearing none, those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? The motion prevails in the minute for February the 6th has been approved. All right, so we're going to go back to Representative Schultz. Uh, so, Representative Schultz. Mm -hmm. Go to the table, please. 
uh, remo re renews her motion that House File 267 be recommended for placement on the general register. No. Is there any discussion from members? So there being no further discussion, the chair renew renews the motion again. The House File, I'm sorry, House File 267 be amended. I'm sorry. Be patient, you guys. So it's representative motion. So all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion prevails. The House File 267 is recommended for placement on the general register. Thank you, Representative Schultz. Okay, to Representative Lean Bill. To Chair, to Representative Lean. The chair will entertain a motion to adopt the DE1 amendments, author's amendments. Could you um, speak to the amendment again, please? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we are offering this amendment in response to some concerns DHS had, Department of Human Services had. Uh, regarding the bill, this is a technical amendment. Uh, the amendment does change the process related to the rate adjustment, uh, but the end result of the bill would stay the same as what we are intending in the original bill. The amendment does the following. It changes the data point that's used to determine the rate difference. The new data point is better because it's easier to compare across state lines. Um, it makes some changes to how the rate difference and rate adjustments are calculated. The new process was suggested by DHS to simplify the calculation and reduce administrative burden. And it ultimately places the burden on the provider to request the rate adjustment rather than having the uh, agency do the rate comparison and then give the rate adjustment each year. Thank you for that clarification again. Representative Pinto moves the DE1 author's amendment. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? The DE1 amendment is adopted. Representative Lean, you have presented your bill. We're going to move the amendment. Okay, is there anyone um, from the committee who like any discussion on the bill? Okay. There being no further discussion, the chair removes her motion that House File 258, as amended, be recommended for referral to the Committee on Ways and Means. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? The motion prevail, House File 182, as amended, is recommended for re-referral to the Committee on Ways and Means. Thank, Thank you, you so Madam much. Chair and members. You're on your way. Okay, Representative Schultz. <laughs> so we're gonna move House File 168. So I'd like to move House File 168 to Ways and Means. And I have a DE1 amendment. Okay. Representative Schultz moves the DE1 author's amendment. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? No. Well, she didn't say the DE1 amendment is adopted. Representative Schultz, please present your bill. So members, Madam Chair, I passed out a summary of the report, the OLA report on home and community-based services, the financial oversight that Representative Tina Liebling had mentioned earlier. Um, and in this report, I uh, took a deep dive to look at our DWRS system and the reimbursement rates and worked with many other people to look to see how we could improve that based on the OLA recommendations. And so one big key insight was that the reimbursement rates were not tied directly to wages of those direct support staff professionals. And so I wanted to make sure that we could address the workforce shortages in this area by making sure that those working directly with um, the, the clients were seeing wage increases. And so the unique part of this, this amendment and this bill is that we are making changes um, by tying the wages of workers to the wages that the Bureau of Labor Statistics, BLS, 
identifies for the classifications of jobs that are in, within the reimbursement rate framework. So that's one big difference in what we currently have. And we also are using information from the federal government about how um, we are allowed to reimburse and provide a framework for reimbursement rates to these providers. So this um, cleans up some of the language. We recently received notification that the banding would no longer be extended. The, this banding was to phase in a new framework over time. So we did not get the extension approved by the federal government to do that extension. So that's one clarification in, this, in, in the amendment um, and the underlying bill. Um, we also uh, took a look at when inflation would occur. So initially it was every five years. Uh, we improved that to looking at inflation and wage increases every two years. So that's one big um, um, change from what we currently have in state statute. And we're also trying to use the most recent wage and labor statistics from the BLS rather than the lagged information. And based on the OLA report, we're requiring more reporting from the providers on wages, staffing ratios, vacancies, information that will help us improve in the future these reimbursement rates and framework going forward because we're not collecting sufficient information. In fact, the agencies collect more information in the PCA system than the home and community-based um, system currently. It also um, introduces the definition of direct care staff and reporting on direct care staff in this industry. And I'm happy to add, answer questions. Um, there are, this amendment in this bill, though, there continues to be more work on it. So it is in our interest to make sure that we address the workforce shortages and the low wages in this industry and correct those issues. And I'm still working on language to improve um, reimbursement to wages when there's long tenure and years of experience. So looking at a competitive workforce factor and how that would affect wages, making sure it gets to wages, um, and also looking at overtime and making sure that we account for reimbursement and to account for overtime. Because right now with the workforce shortages, a lot of individuals are working overtime. So we, we will continue to amend this going on to the next committee and do more work on it. This is a very, a very much a finance bill and the reimbursement rate is a finance issue. And so really we may just want to focus on the policy content of the bill in this committee. Thank you, Representative Schultz. Uh, if there's anyone else in the audience who would like to testify to House File 168? Is there David Gotcha? Karcher. Karcher, David? No. Mr. Carter, can you introduce yourself for the record? And, uh, yes, I will. Is this on? Hello. My name is David Karcher, often known as Butch. Mm -hmm. I've been uh, providing services for a little over 30 years, and I run an agency known as Karcher Foss Services. It is a for profit, privately owned company. Um, I'm actually testifying in the Senate hearing later on the workforce crisis, but um, I thought I'd add a few things here. Thank you for the opportunity. I very much appreciate it, and I think I speak for many in the room. Um, a few reminders for uh, Senate or, uh, House reps sitting here, some questions to ask as we go forward. One is a reminder that the 1353 based on an average wage and uh, representative started to address that here at the end. But that was designed by statistics that were many years ago. And it was, as you said, from the BLS states uh, stats. Those stats are based on what we're actually paying, but those rates were already being established by the rates we were getting paid back then. So our desire to pay more money was already being regulated by those stats. So that would have flogged the stats at the, at the Bureau because we were paying the most we could at that point. DWRS was required to be a budget neutral program when it came into effect. The state was under extreme pressure to get it done. And they, they um, 
asked us for information. We gave them much of that information. And I firmly believe that some of that information needed to be flogged in order to keep it budget neutral. We put in there what we thought staff should be making. We were fighting back then for 2 and 3% COLA raises that we weren't getting. And then DWRS came in, and I remember the mandate. It had to remain budget neutral. So even though we put a wage in there, an average wage of 12-something, whatever it was at the time, they told us that's to pay your highs and your lows. You have to have a profit. All we have is labor. You have to have money left over to pay your exorbitant licensing fees and other such things. So if you mandate a minimum wage of 13, whatever the rate tool is at this point, without addressing long-term care, you've essentially put me out of business, which uh, I have some statistics that I will share with you. Um, so. I have no problem. I already pay my staff $13 an hour. They start at $12.50. They go to $13 Im immediately after 90 days training. Most of my staff don't even make it to the 90 days because they quit. The turnover rate is so high and the demands are so high. For the Senate hearing, I have a job description of a DSP, the person you want to pay $11 an hour, three pages long three pages of responsibilities you want to give somebody $12 an hour to do or 13. If the rate tool was not messed up from the beginning or adjusted to meet the, the budget neutrality, then why are we having an influx of, of high needs clients being demitted from their homes? Why are we having a, a, a huge amount of exceptions? DHS is currently working on a pre-authorization for exceptions because they know how many are coming. The tool needs to be fixed to address our actual costs. And yes, you do need some information. I'll be happy to share that with you. But the thought that providers are not doing everything we can to address this workforce crisis is ludicrous thinking. I'm sorry to be insultive, but I am insulted. I'm going to read to you just my stats from this morning, if you, don't, if you bear with me. And I really do appreciate this opportunity. OK. I had my staff pull the records this morning. Between now and Sunday night, I have 262 full-time shifts that need to be filled. I currently have 88 openings out of 262. That's almost one-third of the openings. 19 of those are at one particular house. That house is supposed to have 36 shifts. It's going to have 19 open. One has 28 shifts, it's going to have 17 openings. I just informed Alex Bertolic I will probably be demitting those clients from their homes because I can't serve them safely. So, and then the obvious thing to recognize is those are what the shifts I know of. Those, does, that does not cover call-ins, six, I'm not coming, snow days. That is just literally what we're fighting Monday morning to try to fill. And we're getting three to four requests for uh, leave, exception leaves, because they've used all their PTO, they've used all their FMLA, and they are having medical crisis at home. Their own families are suffering because of the amount of hours. These staff, these DSPs, are working 60 to 70 hours a week trying to meet the mandate. And it's not being addressed. And they are breaking. Just this week alone, last week, I lost the two what are known as program managers. I have two of them. They oversee the entire operation of my business. Both of them turned in their resignations, stating their own mental health was in jeopardy and their family life was in jeopardy. I have one or two house managers left. Those are the people that actually keep the house running on a daily basis. Out of seven, I have two left, and one of them just resigned as well due to the family life. Her husband threatened, either you quit that job or we're getting divorced. So, I know I'm being a little direct and maybe I'm out of line and I apologize, but it's time people start listening to what reality is. The bureaucratic adjustment being made here today is going to do absolutely nothing to address this. Nothing except create more work for me when I don't have the people to do the work in the first place. Person-centered, you need people in the house to do person-centered. And I, I spend every penny I can trying to recruit people. Thank you very much. And again, I apologize for my passion. Mr. Akashi, I want to just thank you for testifying. Just calm down. 
Uh, I, I just want to, I'm sorry. I do want to say is thank you for testifying and for bringing some real life realities into this committee hearing today. We appreciate it. I just found it a little comical that you were short staffed at the beginning. You couldn't meet your quota. <laughs> and I just want you to know that if you'd like, I will come and brush your teeth. And tomorrow morning, somebody else will come and brush them. And the next day, there might not be anybody there. I appreciate, we appreciate thank the you. reality. Thank you. So is there uh, any discussion? Another testifier? OK. Representative Albright, you come to the table. Um, let's start with the testifier and just hold your question for a moment. Could you? Okay. I'll wait until after this uh, testifier. Yes, thank you, Madam Thank Chair. you. Uh, please introduce yourself for the record and um, begin your testimony. Yes. Chair Moran and committee members, my name is Lynn Noren, and I'm the president of RISE, a nonprofit organization that provides employment and day services to people who have disabilities throughout the metro area and across central Minnesota. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak briefly to House File 168 and the Delete Everything Amendment. We in the disability services community recognize Representative Schultz's commitment to working on this complex and critical issue of our state's disability services rate system. We also appreciate the intent of the Delete Everything Amendment and we strongly share Representative Schultz's goal of strengthening our rate setting system and increasing the wages and benefits for the critical direct support staff who provide these disability services. I've been working in partnership with the Department of Human Services on disability waiver rate setting legislation since the very beginning, so almost 10 years now. Um, there are positive components of this amendment which we support, including the movement of the regular adjustments for certain factors in the rate setting formula from every five years to every two years to more accurately reflect the most recently available economic data. Additionally, we support the provider data reporting requirements that will help us gain a better understanding of how legislative action around the components of this rate setting formula are impacting our workforce shortage. However, there are two components of the Delete Everything Amendment that cause us great concern in terms of unintended consequences. The first is that the Delete Everything Amendment contains no competitive workforce factor, which will make it very difficult for us to move the needle at all in addressing the current 17% wage differential identified by a DHS analysis between wages paid to disability services staff as compared to other similar job opportunities in the community. At RISE, we employ over 200 DSPs. These employees are critical to our mission every day, and yet it can be very difficult to retain them when there are an abundance of other jobs in the community that they can go to that require similar skills and pay more. Second, the language on lines 13.17 and 13.18 of the Delete Everything Amendment would be extremely difficult to actually implement as it doesn't recognize that the wage factor in the rate setting formula is, a, is an average wage based on all staff wages, including overtime costs and variable wages based on tenure and duties. An example from RISE is we have three levels of DSPs at RISE. Um, some of the roles are entry level and they're highly supervised. Some require more independence and yet others are lead roles due to the experience level of the team member. They're all captured in the DSP base wage range. It's important to us at RISE to have a clear career path. And although I'm certain we have an average within the component value wage, individual team members have varying wages based on their duties and their tenure. Due to this and other complexities around how real service costs are or are not accounted for in the rate setting formula, if the wage factor is set at a minimum wage for all direct care staff, then providers would have to provide services at a cost that is above our reimbursement from the state. Every cost component in the DWRS rate formula is an average factor. I think we heard that in the department's presentation today. It is not a cost-based system. Businesses like RISE work within the parameters of the entire framework. One other quick example is that DSPs can work on various types of DWRS services in any given day. Some of our team members will provide transportation, then support a group of individuals in day training habilitation, and later go to a community-based job site to support people that we serve. There are varying base wages for each of these services. 
I do believe that the reporting aspects of the bill will gather information to demonstrate the actual wage averages that are being paid by providers, comprehensive data that, as we heard, is not available today. We look forward to continuing our, our work with Representative Schultz and others of you that care deeply, as we do, about having a disability services rate system that supports those people who provide access to helping people live their best lives. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and to the testifier, uh, thank you for testimony. Um, and you may have um, responded to this, but I just want to be clear. Is there anyone that has disagreed with the uh, reporting requirements outlined in the DE amendment? I'm not aware of anyone who has disagreed with the reporting requirements. I think what, it, what we care about as a provider community is doing that once. And we see that show up in different pieces of legislation, and we hope that it could just be one time of reporting, not multiple times of reporting the same information. Thank you. Representative Albright? Madam Chair, I'm not sure if this testifier is uh, appropriate, but I know that there's another gentleman that who has supported us uh, in ex explanation of DBRS, I'm wondering if you would permit me to call him down to answer a couple questions. Mr. Goodnow? Yes, please. <clears throat> Madam Chair. All right. Thank you. Um, Representative Albright? Thank you, Madam And then Chair. please introduce yourself for the record. Um, Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Kevin Goodnow. Um, I represent the Minnesota Organization for Habilitation and Rehabilitation, who is also a member of the Best Life Alliance. Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Goodnow, we've heard a lot about the change in the compensation structure going from a, a average to a minimum. Um, and we are talking about policy in, in <clears throat> terms of words. Words have incredible meaning. I'm just wondering how that affects our interpretation of compensation as it was mentioned by the previous testifier. How does that impact the overall uh, responsibility for compensating people within, what I understand, 95% of uh, the funding actually comes from federal programs. How does that all work together? Mr. Goodnow. Uh, Mr. Chair, Madam Chair, uh, Representative Albright, I'm not clear on the question. Could you restate it? Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Goodnow, in, in light of testimony that we've already heard, how does this even work, the DE? Oh, Ms. Mr. Madam no. Chair, uh, Representative Albright, with regard to the requirement of paying a certain wage, uh, Madam Chair, Representative Albright, um, as um, Ms. Noren mentioned, I don't believe it works as structured in the Delete All Amendment. Um, I do know more and the Best Life Alliance are committed to making sure that we, first of all, are accountable as to where the money is going. Um, based on the, the testimony of the previous, the testifier before Ms. Noren, um, with all the vacancies out there, the organizations don't, can't make money. They don't bring in revenue unless they provide the service. If they can't provide the service, they need people to provide those services. So, you know, for the folks that I'm aware of, they, they definitely are going to be putting money into the wages and benefits related to uh, the individuals being hired and providing the services. Um, but as Ms. Noring kind of laid out, the the challenge with the way it's structured is it basically says you must pay a certain level based on the um, category of service that you're providing, so your base wage for that. And the challenge is that you may, a, a certain individual will come in and may work eight hours in a day. But they may be able to, the, the rate setting methodology is determining a rate for a 15 minute unit. For the most part, there are some day, day services and partial day, but they're moving to a 15 minute unit. If you're able to bill out all those 15 minute units so you can bill out the full eight hours, at least you're closer to being able to make it work, but usually there's downtime in that. So perhaps on average, and it varies from provider to provider, they may have somebody that's employed and being paid for eight hours in a day, but they may be only able to generate revenue or bill them out for <coughs> six hours in that day. So that's one of the challenges with the way that's structured. Also within the rate framework, um, there's also regional variance factors. So depending upon where you're at in the state, there can be a biggest swing of, of up to around 10% because some will go down five and some will go up five. Um, so you have that variation to deal with as well. 
Having said all that, the provider community is very strongly supportive of, of, of and are, is open to some sort of requirement. We just want to make sure it's, it's doable and it's enforceable. Um, we have a lot of good players out there and sometimes we have folks, occasionally we have some anomalies that are bad players and we want to make sure that we don't penalize the good players for following the law and the intent of the law and let the, the bad players off. But we do want to make sure that it's both doable and enforceable. And we, we're committed to working with uh, Representative Schultz and anybody else who's interested in, in coming up with language that does work around that. Thank you. Representative Albright. Thank you. Um, bit of an open-ended question because I think this is a subject that really is important and I'm going to borrow uh, a uh, definition that Representative Pinto um, reminded me of. Um, what other negative externalities uh, can you foresee coming about if this were made into law? The, the, no. Madam, Madam Chair, Representative Albright, the delete all amendment, there is one um, element that hasn't been mentioned in the delete all amendment, amendment that is, um, well, there's a couple, most of it's been covered by, Rep, by Ms. Norn uh, with regard to we do need, in order for us to be competitive, and I know Representative Schultz Made, said that she wanted to move forward with addressing that issue at some point of the competitive workforce factor. In order to be more competitive in hiring people and filling those vacancies, we do need to figure out a way to be able to pay people more. And in that regard, I think we need to do something with regard to the rates. The competitive workforce factor was something that in cooperation with DHS, we came up with as a potential solution to that. We're not wedded to that solution. If there's other ideas out there that would accomplish the same thing, we're supportive of that. Um, there is um, in the bill a codification of the 7% cut that occurred on July 1st, 2018. Um, that basically, um, there's currently federal litigation that's going on with regard to that. And so by passing that language, it would actually um, supports the state's position with regard to that cut. And so it's taking a position in that ongoing litigation right now. Um, I think there's some question as to what legislative intent was, if um, it was um, the state should have done it or was allowed to do it in the way they did it. That's a question that's before the courts right now. And so the concern is by codifying that language at this point, you could undermine that, that federal litigation that's ongoing. All right, Thank Representative you. Newt. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I have real concerns about this bill, certainly that it is codifying that 7% cut. And, and really, I'm a little confused, and, and perhaps Representative Schultz, this is for you, or perhaps, Mr. Goodenow, you could answer the question. Um, you know, 95% of funding, uh, people are reliant on, on Medicaid, on public programs for this. If we're cutting the 7% and we want to address the workforce shortage, I'm not sure how we cut funds and somehow solve the workforce shortage. Frankly, I use the example, I have, I have two teenage boys who work at Dairy Queen and they make over $11 an hour. And I'm not sure how cutting that funding and codifying that cut leads us to solving this workforce shortage um, for, for people who are really doing an incredibly difficult job. Um, and frankly, you know, uh, Mr. Karcher, who spoke to us, I mean, these providers right now are taking on a massive liability by even providing these services. Uh, and, and as he indicated with, the, um, with his staffing shortages, he doesn't have options. The department takes no responsibility for this. He has no options. His option is to demit and place these people in emergency rooms. This is, I, I, I for the life of me, cannot understand how codifying that cut somehow solves this problem. So I guess if you have some idea as to how we remove funds and somehow move forward, I'm not understanding how this bill is solving this problem. Representative Schultz. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. So, you know, what is an important point that you're making and our testifiers are making is that there are a lot of vacancies and workforce shortages and wages are depressed in this area. So if we um, just go forward and increase reimbursement rates with our existing language, it may never translate into higher wages. There's no guarantee that it could lead to higher wages and address the workforce shortages. So there's at least 2,800 vacancies 
and direct support professionals. There's close to 7,000 vacancies in PCAs. And so what I'm trying to do, we're trying to do is create language that we can all support to make sure that those reimbursement rates, when, when we increase those rates, that they go to increasing higher wages to address the workforce shortage. So that's what's a priority for me and many of my colleagues is to make sure we're addressing the wages. And so we can attract individuals into this area and we can reduce turnover. So that's what's the priority, how we get there. This is very complicated technical language on DWRS. I think we can all agree on that. It's very complicated. Um, it's probably more complicated than it needs to be. Mm -hmm. I think Kevin and I both agree on that. Um, but it's what we're going to work with, this structure of this being prospective payments um, and these 15-minute increments and in the service job going forward. So um, we are going to talk about competitive workforce and, and um, see how that can fit into this really complicated formula on reimbursement rates so we can keep up. And once we can increase wages, those will be our base wages where we're looking at the median wage in those job classification codes, and we're updating those every two years to keep up with inflation. Um, it's also difficult in terms of when someone's there longer. So in the current DE1 amendment, it's saying paying the minimum or greater on those median wage classifications. So we just need to factor that if someone's there for more than 90 days after they've gotten the training and there's a bump up, that's translated into their payment rate but it gets to their wages. So that's the language we're working on now. And hopefully at the next stop at the finance committee, we can put that in as another amendment and address all of the concerns that um, we've heard here today. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Representative Schultz, are you, are you saying that you will reinstate the 7% in the next amendment? Is that what I just said? That's heard? not gonna fix the problem of low wages in this industry. There's no guarantee that when we, we're just talking about increased reimbursement rates. There's no guarantee that that's going to uh, go to wages. And we want to bill when we do increase the reimbursement rates that they also translate to higher wages. Sure. Madam Chair, thank you. Um, wow. I, so, so the assumption is what? That the reimbursement rates are, are happening and folks are just pocketing the difference? That that is not going to care for the people who are in their charge? I'm sorry, Representative Schultz. Thank you, Madam Chair. So we don't know because we're not collecting the data on wages. And in, the, in this DE1, we're going to require reporting of providers to see what's happening to wages in this industry to find out when we do increase reimbursement rates, what happens to wages. So there's, we don't, we don't know. I mean, hopefully some of it is going to wages, but we don't know that's happening for every provider. Representative New. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and thank you. And it's, and I forget, was it Ms. Knorr? Um, I, 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 I appreciate your comments that, um, that, that this additional reporting is helpful. And certainly I agree that that, that that would be helpful. I'm still just not sure how cutting funding leads to solving this problem. And perhaps, Mr. Goodnow, a question for you. Um, you know, talking about the, the sort of these billing increments of 15 minutes that perhaps somebody is working for eight hours, but they're only able to bill for six hours. So where is that additional two hours made up that, that the providers have to pay? Mad Mr. Madam Goodnow. Chair, Representative New, it's so they provide the services they get reimbursed for it. So they have to make it up within the rates that they're getting paid for the services they're providing. Um, as was mentioned about when we were talking the disability services area, high 90s, maybe in some cases, almost 100% of revenues are coming through medical mm -hmm. assistance. Yeah. That's a share, that's federal and state money together. Sure. Um, they don't have the ability to shift the cost to other areas. I, I know some of the nonprofits in particular do separate fundraising, but that doesn't even come close to doing anything to, to offset that. So it's, it's, it's costs that are, um, that, that they wouldn't be getting reimbursed for specifically and they have to figure that out. But that's assumed within, you know, if they're getting paid for six hours of work and you're paying somebody for eight hours, that's assumed in some of their overhead costs that they have to figure out how to, out of their revenues to do that. Um, I, I do want to clarify one thing is that the amendment in the bill itself or the provisions with regard to the 7% rate reduction on July 1st does not necessarily cut the rates. It's codifying what yeah. 
the, what has already been done. Um, and our, our concern would be it's un, undoing or undermining a, an ongoing, ongoing litigation at a time when there's not a replacement for that 7% or a partial replacement for it. Thank so you. I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I have worked with Representative Schultz on this, and I think that our, um, it is very complicated. And um, our intention with this, I think Representative Schultz's intention, is to make this work and to be able to pay wages that actually help bring and keep people in the profession. So I think we all share that goal. There's really no question about that. But I would like to direct members to the um, report, the summary that Representative Schultz handed out, and just to say, explain why we really want to dig into this very deeply and why we really need a fiscal note. So you don't get a fiscal note until you move the, the bill to the Finance Committee. And so that's why, you know, what I think what she's trying to do here is try some different ways. Of, um, of doing this so that we can just see how much we're gonna, what the bill will do and how much it will cost. Because if you look at the summary, and this is now looking back a few years, but um, it says that the, ex medic first of all, it was difficult for the OLA to put a comprehensive price tag on mm. this system because of the different financial reporting requirements and payment methods. So as a state, we really, even the OLA, as good as it is, really could not figure out how much this thing was costing us. Then under that it says, and I, I, I wish I had the whole report here, because and you should really read it, members. There's a lot of very good information in it, even though it is now somewhat outdated. But um, $2.4 billion in fiscal year 2015 for about 64,000 people with disabilities and the elderly, a median cost of $21,993 per, per person. Um, and then, you know, so that's a lot of money. Now, is it too much money? Maybe not, because it depends, of course, on what we're getting for that money. But if we're going to spend that money, I think all of us owe it to our constituents to have a pretty good understanding that that money is buying what we think it's buying and, and you know, and that it's going to where we think it's going. And as Mr. Goodnow said, I mean, this is a huge, this is a lot of providers. Nobody is saying here that any provider is not doing their utmost. In fact, I personally know several who are really working hard to do this, and I do fully understand that this is a, this is a system in crisis, and we need to do something about that. But also I want to point out on this same report, <coughs> It says in fiscal year 2015, 10% of the providers accounted for 70% of the MA payments, 10%. Now, I don't know how many there are. In fact, I kind of like to ask Mr. Goodnow that if he knows how many different providers there are, or maybe Ms. Bartolik would know that better. I, I don't know. But, you know, certainly the People, I, I know certain providers can come here and very validly and with, you know, great, uh, I mean, they, I know that many of them do a super job for the people they serve and that they're doing it under very difficult conditions. We have absolutely no doubt about that. And I would venture to guess that every single legislator in this body, House and Senate, wants to do the right thing for the folks who are being served and make sure that we keep the system afloat. And that, that means paying for overhead and all of those things. At the same time, um, you know, we've had a system for many years where a lot, a lot, a lot of money has gone out the door. And, and the costs are climbing, because when this banding comes off, I think we, we didn't hear the number, but I understood it was something over 30 million is going to go into that system immediately with the release of the banding. Um, so I'm just saying that we, we need to um, pass this through just so that we can continue to work on it with everybody's kind of good faith here that we want a good result for both the people getting the service and the people providing the service. But if we just um, kind of look back and say, oh, you know, we can't, it's all about the 7%, you know, first of all, and I will get, actually get to my question unless Ms. Bartolik answer it, but the 7% cut actually only occurred, I think it's in about uh, 
to about 25% um, or 23% of the people who are getting these rates. So most, most of the providers and most of the people, 75 or so percent, were not affected by that. So before we answer that question, uh, Mr. Uh, Ms. Uh, Bertolic, and whether we do or not, you know, a lot of this is going to be heard in the yes. finance committee. You know, I would really like us to just stick to the policy piece of that, and once it move over to the next right. finance committee, that we would deal with some of these uh, dollar amounts and rates amounts and things yeah. like that. Yeah, and so, thank you, Madam Chair. I just really wanted to yeah. um, sort of establish here that we're not trying to pull a fast one on anyone. We're trying to all do the same thing. We just want to make sure that we're really being fiscally responsible and that we get all the information as we move forward and look at different ways that we might achieve these goals. But Ms. Bartolik, how many providers are there in the system? <laughs> Mr. Ms. Um, Madam Chair and Representative Liebling, well, the report does say it's a little over 4,000 uh, providers are delivering home and community-based services. That number does vary over time. And I do want to point out that over half of those providers serve 10 or fewer people. So we're talking about a system that does have a number of providers that are very large and are able to serve many parts of our system. But there's also a number of services that are very specialized and very local in local communities. All right, so um, this is what I like to do um, because we have Representative Haverson bill that's going to come up next that has some very similar but different perspective around this 7% um, increase in uh, this waiver conversation that we're having right now. So um, we have three people. Um, three legislators who are uh, asking to speak. If you can stay to the policy part of this so that we can take a vote and move on to the Havison, which is more about the rate increase. Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I would request a roll call on the bill. Um, <clears throat> this is for Representative Schultz. Um, I shared with the members of the community a letter date, dated uh, April 26th of 2018 that was sent to uh, then Governor Mark Dayton, uh, urging him uh, on behalf of the DWRS system. And I just want to point out uh, in the fourth paragraph, and, and Representative Schultz, you did also sign on to this letter, as a number of others in this committee did, but just remind the, the members and the committee that this letter was sent, and I'll read it verbatim, Minnesota cannot afford to let this rate cut go through especially at a time when disability services are already in the midst of an unprecedented staffing shortage. So my question to you, Representative Schultz, is what changed? Ms. Schultz. Uh, Representative Albright, Madam Chair, so this letter is all about the wages of the workers and the shortage. And so I take this very seriously, as do all of us, that we need to address the workforce shortage by making sure wages rise. And so, um, you know, I wasn't that familiar with DWS my first year, but now I'm getting to know as much as our lobbyist Kevin Good know about it. And um, I think we're going to be on a more even playing field now that more of us are learning about the technical aspects of it and the algorithms and the payment methodology. And so I think that, you know, the federal government said that we are not going to reimburse the state for this um, one, one and five percent increase in inflation as we waited for the 2017 increase automatic inflation adjustment. We went outside the framework, increased uh, the payment rates for inflation. The Fed said, we're not going to let you double count and do it a second time of this inflationary increase. That's when we started talking about this competitive workforce factor. Um, and that the federal government may or may not approve of that type of methodology. We don't know. But the primary um, point of this letter is that wages are depressed in this area and we want to make sure that the provider reimbursement system that we set up make sure that it'll be directly connected to um, addressing wages so madam chair thank you madam chair and uh, representative uh, schultz help me understand then um, by codifying the cut which would then not only impact about 28 percent or though of the workforce you're going to codify it for everyone and drop everybody's wages you're going to nullify the lawsuit which from a standpoint of having a basis for legislation um, you certainly 
stand on better footing if you have a piece of, of, of litigation for or against that's been decided on the case to act upon. So you're nullifying that. Um, notwithstanding the fact that we gave uh, the DWRS system a 7% pay increase in 2014. And I'd be curious to find out from the first two testifiers what happened with that money. I dare say it's probably, uh, the answer is that it went to wages, um, but I won't belabor that. So I'm just, I'm at a loss for understanding how the DE encourages wages to increase when you're giving them less money to do that with. I was an economics minor, and I think I know enough to uh, appreciate that, you know, the supply-demand curve here. Um, you, can't, you can't increase wages with a very a significantly smaller supply of, of payroll. So I'm not asking for a response because I don't know that there is one. Um, but I, I just want to alert you to the fact that I think you are treading into area at your own peril and to the peril of the people who rely upon this system with their very lives. Representative Schultz. Thank you, Madam Chair. So it does not codify a rate cut at all. That is not accurate. That is not an accurate statement. It is trying to understand a complicated system adjust the payment rates. They are not going to necessarily go down. They are likely to go up by quite a bit, reimbursement rates to providers under a new system. And to make sure that there's reporting and that wages increase when we increase the provider reimbursement rates. That's what's important. That's the piece that's been missing in prior legislation. And that's what the goal is, I think, for all of us. So there's, you, I don't want to make this political about being a rate cut. It's not a rate cut. We're trying to make sure that the reimbursement rates make sense, use accurate data, and that workers see increases in wages when reimbursement rates go up. Representative Pinto. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I guess I wanted to uh, support the comment you made earlier about the jurisdiction, jurisdictional issues here. And so for members of the public, um, either in the room or outside, who may not be aware, you know, we do, our, we do our work in committee, kind of focus on a particular area to make sure we build up specialization in that area and then hand it off to another group that has specialization in another area. And of course, the vast majority of this, uh, this proposal relates to um, human services financing, how we spend money, and then the implications of what happens with that money being spent. And there is a separate Health and Human Services Finance Committee to address those issues. We are the policy committee. Um, and I know there are some policy issues uh, in the bill, such as having the um, DHS to, to publish the report on, on labor market data, as referenced by Representative Schultz. Um, but it does seem to me that, um, that regarding those policy issues, it seems like, like uh, what is described here makes a lot of sense, I think, regarding the finance issues as well. But I do just want to point out to members and the public as well that we really are focused on the one area rather than the other. Um, I appreciate the taking of the, the thoughtful uh, approach on this issue. Um, uh, there was, my understanding is that the fix um, uh, that, that there was a you know um, language on this in the bill that that then was vetoed. Um, we want to make sure that we are taking a thoughtful approach that can actually make uh, a real difference in the market. And I appreciate your efforts, Representative Schultz, to make sure that we're making that difference. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Representative Pearson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I guess the question I have, because again, a lot of the tracking, a lot of that. Uh, data analysis seems, you know, again, that's that's the policy aspect of this. I guess my question is actually, if we removed the codification of the the new rates that aren't a cut, um, if we remove that language, why couldn't this policy, the actual policy aspects of this bill, why couldn't they be moved forward without that codification of the of what has turned out to be a seven percent cut to a lot of the providers? Uh, representatives, um, so this is the policy bill, and for whatever reason, we have two bills here that are that there's a lot of details around rate increases that really should have just gone to finance committee, but here we are, you know. And I don't want to continue to belabor the whole rate increase piece because that will be sorted out. Uh, this bill and the next bill, uh, Representative Haverson bill will be sorted out in, in the finance committee part of it. Um, it's just, some, you know, we are here with two bills. 
right, with a lot of um, language around the finances of it. Um, and so my, my hope and our hope is that, my hope is that we would pass this out of this committee and let it go to the uh, next committee, which is um, Ways and Means, so that we can, you know, get a fiscal note on this bill, we can look at what the costs are, and Representative Schultz, along with Representative Havison, can get all these, the stakeholders together and move forward on how we can make sure that we are, you know, uh, really uh, looking to the providers, but also ensuring that those who are on the, 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 the front end, the, the, on the forefront of working with individuals are also getting a pay increase. We see value in both of those entities, but a lot of what I'm hearing is that the foundational piece of this bill being created around rate increases, waiver, the whole waiver piece is, the foundationally is, is needs to be worked on. So I'm going to uh, allow Representative Schultz to um, to respond to Representative Pearson's question, um, and then we're going to move on quickly um, and take a vote. Uh, the roll call has been called, and we will do the roll call and move this bill forward. Representative Schultz. Thank you, Madam Chair. I didn't think I heard a question, but um, I think we can address all of those questions about the seven percent and the inflationary automatic inflation adjustments in HHS finance or another finance division. Madam Chair, again, my question is kind of the inverse. Like, in the absence of the 7%, in, a, in the absence, why can't this bill travel without that is actually the question. It's the policy question. Why can't this travel without the cut? And, and I guess very directly, because I don't sit on the Finance Committee, I'm not asking about that aspect of or the codification language. I'm asking why this can't travel as Is just a policy Schultz? bill. Would you like to respond to the question? Well, I think we don't take pieces of different bills and send them to different divisions or committees. So we take the whole bill, we hear the, what's relevant in that section of the bill, and we move that bill forward or not. M Madam Chair. Representative Pearson. I guess I'm, I'm asking the question in a different, I, I'm sorry, there's a lot of good policy in here. <laughs> and, and I'm not saying that I'm just trying to amend and strike that out. I'm asking, is the policy of the 7% rate cut, is that dependent on, is, are the rest of these policies dependent on that being in the legislation? You know, why can't we address it in the inverse and pass good policy that's going to provide you with the accurate information you're looking for, the ability to track this, this information, um, all these things that, that many of the providers are actually in favor of uh, without codifying the 7% rate cut? Representative Newt. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so, you know, and we, I, I think we also need to be careful here. We are setting policy that is going to determine the financial side of this. So I think it is important that we talk about this. Clearly, there are a lot of members of the public here who are very concerned about what we are doing in this committee. And we are setting policy that is going to affect these things. So I appreciate you, you letting us further the discussion, because I do think it's important. And I think it's really important to clarify one thing with, with this 7% idea and that we don't know where it's going. That's simply not true. The reality is rate increases that have happened in the past, there have been mandates that 80% of that go directly towards direct service provider wages. 20% uh, can go to inflationary costs. But let's remember, these service providers are paying for housing. They're paying for insurance. They're paying for all kinds of things that need to come out of this as well. And those costs don't stop. So it's, it's just, I just want to make sure we understand that there have been mandates in the past that, that this funding does absolutely go to wages, and we, we just need to make sure that we all understand that. Representative Schultz. Thank you, Madam Chair. So that is true in the PCA world. This is the DWRS world that we're talking about right now, and it gets complicated. So the wage encumbrance, the wage encumbrance that we're talking about, it depends on what waiver rate system you're under. And so when we talk about the PCA bills, we'll be talking about the 88, 72.5% or 80% going directly to wages. So members. Madam Chair, Madam Chair, Madam Chair I guess I would members. just, I, I would ask that question of, of Mr. Excuse Karcher. Me, Representative New. So members, um, we have before us a bill 
a bill in, in, uh, in a full bill, and often bills move that have policies, that have finance parts to it all the time through this body, all the time, right? And so um, what we're going to do is, is we're going to continue to move this bill for it as is. It will go to ways and me and the discussion. And I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, I appreciate the, 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 the members who, are, who came out to testify, who came out to share. We, we heard you, we're listening to you, you know. We, we also heard that there's some unfairness in here. We, we completely hear that, right? And this bill has to move to get to its fullness onto the finance part of what we're discussing in this, um, in this body here, which is a policy committee. It has to move on in order to do real justice for your concerns. Madam Chair. This is really important to us in this body on both sides of the aisles. Madam Chair. And so what we're going to do, we're going to, real quick. Uh, Madam Chair, Alba, I would make a motion to this bill on the table. Uh, all right. And I'll ask for a roll call. Let's do that. Let's go for a roll call. On the motion to lay the table, bill on the table. So there has been a motion to lay the bill on the on the table. Um, let's do a roll call on that. I apologize in advance. I'm losing my voice a little. So. Chair Moran. No. Vice Chair Morrison. No. Minority Lead Keel. Representative Albright. Yes. Representative Backer. Representative Bonner. No. Representative Edelson. No. Representative Fisher. Representative Freiberg. No. Representative Liebling. No. Representative Loeffler. Representative Mann. No. Representative New. Yes. Representative Pearson. Aye. Representative Pinto. No. Representative Robbins. Representative Schomacher. Yes. Representative Schultz. No. Okay, so we have. We have nine no's and five yes. The motion does not prevail. So Representative Schultz renew renews her motion that House File 168, as amended, be recommended for re-referral Ma to the Committee on Ways and Means. Madam the clerk Chair. would take the roll. Madam Chair, was the, um, was the delete all adopted, Madam Chair? Yes, okay. yes it was. Apologies, thank you. <laughs> Madam Chair, just as a point of clarification, parliamentary inquiry. Represent all right. So uh, the re-referral is to which division? The Committee on Ways and Means. And um, not to get too far ahead of the ball on this one, but is there intention after that to be it re-referred to another committee? I believe it. So it moved from, from Ways and Means to HHS Finance, where they would move it to long-term care. Let's take the roll. So, Madam Chair, just to follow up on that, uh, if you will then, it, will it be heard first in finance and HHS finance, or is it going to be re-referred from HHS finance to long-term long care? And then the follow-on is, since long-term care is a subordinate uh, committee, subcommittee of health policy, will it then be re-referred back to health policy before it is re-referred to Ways and Means again? Mm. This, so the order 
uh, of the long term care is a division of HHS Finance. The order of the term will go to HH, HHS Finance to Chair Liebling. From there, it will go to long term care. Um, and then back up. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Let's do the roll call, please. <laughs> Chair Moran. Yes. Vice Chair Morrison. Yes. Minority Lead Keel. Representative Albright. No. Representative Backer. Representative Bonner. Yes. Representative Edelson. Yes. Representative Fisher. Representative Freiberg. Yes. Representative Liebling. Yes. Representative Loeffler. Representative Mann. Yes. Representative New. No. Representative Pearson. No. Representative Pinto. Representative Robbins. No. Representative Schumacher. No. Representative Schultz. Yes. So we have nine yes and five no's. The, the motion prevails. Um, and it's on its way to the Committee on Ways and Means. Thank you so much, Representative. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Okay, so uh, we held this room until 2.45, and so we're going to bring up Representative Halverson in House File 179, Disability Waivers Rate Modified, System Modified. The chair moves that House File 179 be re-recommended for referral to the Committee on Ways and Means. We have the bill before the committee. Welcome, Representative Haverson. I believe you have an author's amendment. Yes, Madam Chair, the A1 amendment. Okay, the chair will entertain a motion to adopt the A1 author's amendment. Anyone want to move? I'll move that. Representative Albright um, moves the A1 author's amendment. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? The A1 amendment is adopted. Representative Haverson, please present your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, just for the committee's um, information, the uh, A1 Authors Amendment is a, an amendment to deal with um, the ruling regarding um, banding. It's a technical amendment. And if people need further information, I would refer to staff. Um, House File 179 is a bill focused on making needed changes to our state system for setting community-based disability service rates. As you all have heard, our community-based disability system is built on the work of direct support professionals who provide critical supports to individuals with disabilities day in and day out, supporting them to live, learn, work, and play as independently as possible. You're also aware, as we have heard, that our state is in the midst of a disability direct support professional workforce shortage, and the crisis has been further compounded by a 7% cut to individuals' disability service rates that began being implemented on a rolling basis in July of 2018. 32,000 Minnesotans rely on community-based services, which are paid through for through medical assistance. Payment rates are directly, directly impact wages for direct care workers. And you can see in the bill, uh, lines uh, 4.2 to 5.1, um, just which services qualify um, for reimbursement under this particular legislation. The bill does three things to begin to address the disability services wait for, workforce shortage. First of all, it implements a competitive workforce factor with future adjustments into our disability rate setting services to begin to address, as you heard, the 17% wage disparity between disability service wages and wages of occupations um, competing for the same workers. Secondly, it adjusts the timing of the scheduled adjustment to the disability rate setting to every two years to better keep pace with the actual economic conditions. 
And lastly, the bill implements important data reporting requirements uh, of these providers of community-based disability services so that we can continue to gather information as has been um, uh, requested and agreed upon um, to uh, further uh, inform legislative actions on workforce shortage and to assure that the dollars invested are flowing to workers. I'd like to thank the other representatives, many of whom are on this committee um, from both caucuses who have signed on as co-authors of this legislation. And I would like uh, Madam Chair um, to introduce uh, the Best Life Alliance Chair, Judy Martyr, to speak about further about the bill. Mrs. Martyr, please introduce yourself and um, continue on with your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair and um, members of the committee. Yes, that's me. I'm Judy Martyr, and I'm bringing up the rear here. And the first thing you need to know about me is that I'm a parent of a daughter with developmental disabilities. And that drives me to advocate for her. And it's one of the reasons that I'm also the current chair of the Best Life Alliance. Um, everything I'm going to say, you've probably already heard from the experts. I do not claim to be an expert. I'm a parent, first and foremost. But being a part of the Best Life Alliance, I mean, we're, we're, it's a group of professionals that um, support families and family members and their other supporters by advocating for home and community-based services. Those of us that are parents need advocates, and Best Life Alliance is a very good representative of that. My daughter, Carla D., she's 51 years old. She's received services since she was uh, uh, diagnosed with Rett syndrome at the age of three. She's all of four foot ten, weighs on a good day 80 pounds. Um, she cannot talk, not a word. But she talks with her eyes. You just look in her eyes and you'll know what she's saying. She needs total support for dressing, hygiene, and eating. She lives in a four-person waiver home, and she needs 24-hour awake staff to ensure her safety and well-being. Ever since our state implemented the new DWRS, which I've learned, Disability Waiver Rate System, that sets the rates individuals receive to be able to access community-based services, the Best Life Alliance has worked collaboratively each legislative session to advance reforms to the waiver rate system so that it supports our Minnesotans with disabilities to live their best lives a goal I can only hope that we all share. This year, our alliance proposes important changes to the rate system that will help address the severe workforce shortage impacting critical supports accessed by my daughter and all people with developmental disabilities that let them live and work in their own communities. As a parent, I've been here a number of times over the past decade to ask for the same thing, competitive wages to help address the severe workforce shortage in the disability community. And after all these years, I feel like we've only gone backwards and competitive wages continue to lose ground. Opportunities for my daughter, Carla D., to give back to her community by shopping and eating and volunteering with assistance from dedicated staff are declining. She is spending more time in her home and not getting out and being a part of where she lives. Quality staff are either too hard to recruit or leave after a short time for better paying work. I ask you to please support the reforms the, dis the disability waiver rate system put forward in this legislation. Our state needs this overdue process to continue to support Carla D and all Minnesotans with developmental disabilities. As much as anyone, they deserve to live their best lives with the support of valued and appropriately compensated qualified staff. 
and I thank you. Thank you, Ms. Judy Martyr. I really appreciate your testimony and your view from a mother who was trying to do the best to advocate for her daughter in great services. Thank you. In good wages. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the audience who would like to testify on House File 179? Okay. Uh, any discussion from the members? Madam Chair. Um, Representative Albright. Thank you. Uh, Representative Alverson, um, I'm a co-author on this bill. Um, and I'm just wondering if uh, you have heard whether or not this rate increase is going to be approved by CMS. Madam Chair. Oh, Representative Havison, please. And uh, Representative Albright, um, I'm going to phone a friend on this. <laughs> um, Madam Chair, Representative Albright, could you repeat the question? Can you please uh, identify yourself again? Yes, ma'am. Um, Kevin Goodno, I'm here on behalf of the Minnesota Organization for Habilitation and Rehabilitation, um, which is also a member of the Best Life Alliance. Thank you. Mr. Goodno, this is a new type of rate increase, and I'm wondering if you have knowledge of it, whether or not it would be approved by CMS. Madam Chair, Representative Albright, um, there's no guarantees in dealing with CMS. Um, in dealing with D8, the Department of Human Services on coming up with, with a a mechanism in order to address the competitive workforce differential between direct care workers and those in like occupations. This was a mechanism that we felt had the best chances of approval. Um, we do believe that with the automatic um, reevaluation of the competitive workforce factor on a regular basis, that's a key part of that. Um, this bill includes an automatic adjustment uh, towards that competitive difference um, each time there's an inflationary adjustment. Um, I'm not sure if it's necessary to go that far, but to be able to do an analysis and have a report sent to the legislature on the differential, I think, is important. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much. Um, any other questions, Member? But no further discussion. Uh, Representative Schultz. I request a roll call vote, please. Okay. Thank you. So a roll call has been requested. Um, so the chair renews her motion that House File 179, as amended, be recommended for re-referral to the Committee on Ways and Means. Um, we will go to the roll call. Thank you. Chair Moran. Vice Chair Morrison. Yes. Minority Lead Keel. Representative Albright. Yes. <laughs> Representative Backer. Representative Bonner. Yes. Representative Edelson. Yes. Representative Fisher. Representative Freiberg. Yes. Representative Liebling. Yes. Representative Loeffler. Representative Mann. Yes. Representative New. Yes. No. Yeah. Yes. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay. okay. Representative Pearson. Yes. Representative Pinto. Yes. Representative Robbins. Yes. Representative Schumacher. Yes. <coughs> Representative Schultz. Yes. With 14 yes and zero no's, the motion prevails. The bill is on its way to the Committee on Ways and Means. So I just want to thank you all for being here today, and um, we will be back tomorrow. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. We are adjourned. <laughs>